Hello and good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're tuning in from today. I've got a great topic for you, one that is a hot debate actually. Is Kubernetes right for us? And what we've got for you today is a few bits and pieces of content to help you sort of understand where Kubernetes might fit in in a, a cloud adoption journey, uh, what it's good at, maybe some of the things it's not as good at. And I wanna bring in the CTO advisor, Keith Townsend, a good friend of mine, and have him bring his perspective. He's actually got his own data center as well um, that he's been building out with some vendors and I'd love to hear a bit about that too. Now you can send us comments and we'll try and answer questions and look at links and things like that as well throughout the talk. So without further ado, I'm gonna invite Keith Townsend on to the stage. Hello, Keith. Hey, Alex, how's it going? Where are you hailing from today? Uh, the mighty, mighty uh, Chicago land region where we have got yet another foot of snow. So it's uh, where uh, it's a good time to be indoors and in locked down. Yeah, definitely. We've had our snow in Peterborough. It's come and gone. And uh, I've even seen Austin has been getting snow today. Chris Anishek was uh, sharing some photos. Really, I remember the last time it snowed there was probably KubeCon. I want to say 2018, late 2017, and we were going to the after party. Um, it was a block party outdoors, and then that really just did not happen. <laughs> yeah, that the outdoor block party doing snow. They do that a lot. I went to a Dell event in uh, uh, Austin. It was really, really cool. Uh, Intel did an amazing drone show, but it was freezing, and uh, it's not something that typically happens in Austin. So... You kind of hit and miss when you schedule a winter outdoor event in Austin. I, was, I thought we could tell people where you and I first met. And uh, again, it's going back to an event. Mm -hmm. DockerCon, I think it was DockerCon 2017, late, latter part of the year. And um, I just got to know Stephen Foskett. And he runs a tech field day where he'll bring in vendors to present to a group of analysts. And generally, the vendors will pay a sponsorship to get... Mm -hmm. The opportunity to bring their product and get feedback from experts and you would just happen to be one of those experts one of the community and Stephen asked me do you want to come and tell us about your open source project and um i think that's where we first met wasn't it that is where we first met we uh, actually got some time uh some time to spend a good deal of conversation. Uh, what was really cool, first time I got introduced to OpenFast and the OpenFast project, you had not yet left uh, your position, your full-time position yet, and kind of done this thing full-time. So I got a, a, a early peek into the early stages of OpenFast. I was really excited about the project. Uh, it has uh, been a really great uh, learning experience for me coming from enterprise IT kind of into the cloud native. Uh, that was more or less my introduction to the cloud native architecture and audience in community period. Because you're not a Kubernetes developer, are you? I mean, you, no, you come a, from a very different background. I come from a, uh, I'm solidly a traditional enterprise IT guy. Uh, I think that, that was the KubeCon. Uh, I'm not sure if that KubeCon or the one after that, the one where uh, they mentioned that, you know, the, you know, treat the enterprise guys as third graders. You know, they're, they're learning, they're maturing into it. So I'm, I'm the third grader in, 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 in the Kubernetes uh, community. That is kind of why I like talking to you because you have this perspective that um, comes from more traditional infrastructure background. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're talking about speeds and feeds, networking, storage, um, configuring VMware and hypervisors. And before, I went independent on my own. I, I worked for a while at, at VMware as well, like yourself. And mm -hmm. uh, at sim probably similar time, we both uh, moved on. And so you have your own business now. Yep. Uh, I run the CTO Advisor, which is an advisory firm that mainly does, con that does content marketing. So a lot of the big vendors are my uh, customers, full disclosure, HPE, Intel, VMware, Dell, Oracle, 
uh, et cetera. So we create a lot of uh, research, some of it sponsored, some of it not, the ctoadvisor.com. In pursuit of that, uh, we built the data center, uh, the CTO Advisor hybrid infrastructure. That data center is more or less sponsored by Intel, where we took, you know, kind of that traditional enterprise stack and start to migrate it towards a more native cloud, not cloud native, but cl native cloud uh, experience. Okay. And uh, as many people will know, if you're watching now or you're tuning in later, um, I also set up my own company to to do what I believed in, which was to keep open fires as a project moving forward and developing, creating new ideas. And much of the much of the time I spend with open fires probably split between the user experience of how we want functions to work and integrate, and also um, touching the lower levels of Kubernetes, understanding what's changing in it, and and just trying to keep up. Because actually, it's it's a space I think that um, moves very very quickly, and that's probably a good way of sort of segueing into the topic today. We were asking, is Kubernetes right for us? And uh, certainly, it's definitely been the right choice for the Open Fast project up to a point. And more recently, you see on my T-shirt here, we created FASD, which um, runs would probably run really well on a hypervisor or a single VM like. Um, like you might have on a, a VMware deployment. You effectively have the guts of Kubernetes, the bit that's right at the end of a node, Containerd for running containers, container networking initiative for, for networking them together, and OpenVAS and not much more. And so it's been kind of interesting because I didn't expect the kind of uptake where people would be um, saying, this is actually suitable for us. We can run this in production. Um, and I think we've now got a couple of people tuned in here. But Anne really likes a T-shirt. Um, and we've got it's uh, from the Open Fast community as well. And it's actually evening time in India. So, yeah, good evening to you. So for the technical folks, I do actually have something for you, which is um, straight, we'll get straight in there. And we have a thread that was started last week um, or just before. And in a thread, I said, well, look, if you wanted to start a side project today, or maybe two, um, where would you host them? How much money do you think you'd be open to spending? Um, and let's imagine you need a web, some web element, database, email sending, uh, some kind of object storage. Well, where would you put that? And there's quite a wide range of answers to this. Um, particularly like Keith, you responded to this as well for find where you are. And folks can get this and the other links in the show notes and to find where you are, you're down here. Tell us a bit about your response. Yeah, so, and this is typical enterprise. So in an enterprise, we try not to do anything that we don't have to do. If you think about it, if you think about traditional data centers and where the migrations are going it, uh, from a uh, just services perspective, if you're running your SAP, your Oracle apps, your traditional three tier stack applications that uh, are monolithic applications, VMs and uh, VMware infrastructure are kind of per perfect for that environment. Your operations is geared towards towards that. But when you're talking about not differentiating experience like email hosting or uh, object storage or any of these web services, why would I want to spend my time kind of hosting or managing and curating that stuff when I don't have to? You know, a lot of our services in enterprise IT, while we like them to be centralized and easily consumed by developers they're not we're not service providers so we're not geared towards you know just making generic services available to application developers where they can take and build and and and, and curate these services into a uh, higher end uh often. so why would i want to take that on is is kind of my 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 spiel my the web my website I host it on a, a hosting provider. My email is hosted by a hosting provider. 
all of these non different non differentiated yeah I'll commodity them... you, you that was like commodity items to you yeah. saying yeah okay so i know we've got a few people in the chat here some folks from the community I see amit as well and you know one of the drive one of the drivers here as, as a developer is um we tend to be quite cheap i don't know if you've noticed that i've noticed that <laughs> it's something that I've been working on, and even I am quite cheap. I uh, I would say the services that I've looked at where to send emails, any number of them, the minimum cost to me on my personal credit card every month is $50 mm. just to get the ability to send emails. And uh, I'm talking about things like SendGrid and the alternatives, Um now, that might be okay for one if I get a lot of value out of it. But generally, all of these things, all of these SaaS products tend to have that kind of price tag. They're not all consumption-based. Uh, Mailgun is another one. I wanted to do an email list for my blog. I've been collecting it for, for like six years, 1,500 people on it. Then I thought, okay, well, I want a separate one for the ebook, and I'll collect emails, and then I'll go launch it and email just the people that were interested in it instead of everyone. And it was going to cost me again like 50 bucks a month just to get two email lists to go from one email list to two. And then so you start to think as a developer, is it cheaper for me to write something and use a consumption based product like Amazon's simple email service? I'll give some of my time over to this. I might not see a return in one year, but maybe in two or three, I'll be way up on what I would have been paying them. I think for three less, it might have been 150 bucks a month. Yeah, I think that becomes the question of a hobby versus a business endeavor. For me, I do not have any hesitation on spending money on something that's going to make me money and save me time. So, uh, for example, email. I, I do not want to go through the trouble of Securing an SMTP server, I can easily deploy an SMTP server from, you know, uh, uh, any Linux distribution and be off it, put it, expose it to ex expose a public IP uh, for the port and start sending away. But then I have to worry about blacklisting, whitelisting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. People hacking, trying to constantly hack the service. I have a gigabit uh, uh, symmetric bandwidth coming out of the data center. I'm hosted uh, close to all of the public cloud providers. So I am a sweet honeypot for uh, attackers. And I just don't yeah. want that threat in my data center. It's much easier and simpler for me to just host it if I'm making money from it. Now, if I'm not making money from it, I can easily see this temptation 50 bucks or 100 bucks a month becomes, you know, th those things add up kind of like uh, the streaming services. You may find, well, actually, this streaming service we're using is costing me 50 bucks a month at my personal cash. And it's, I was thinking, well, I needed it for one. We needed it for the Open Faz birthday to stream in 1080p. The only option was to pay 50 bucks. And then I thought, I'm going to cancel it in the new year. Um, because I don't want to be paying that. I only needed it once. And so with a lot of these services, uh, Banner Bear is another one to generate social images. The minimum price to start just to, to get one image a month is 50 bucks. Well, if you have four or five of them, and a lot of them do add value, it, it can add up really quick. And if you're just starting off with a project, you might not want to invest too much. Yeah, um, I think I, I spent maybe about $650 USD on these types of random services from social live to uh, my email management platform, my social media platforms, et cetera. This stuff adds up really quick. And I think my budget is, budget is about $650 a month for those ran these random services. I mean, your business, you doing work with really big clients that pay well. And mm -hmm. I think when we look at this thread, I guess what we're looking at is we were looking at folks like when I was at ADP and I was running open fairs in my spare time as a side project, would I have wanted to pay 50 bucks a month for Zoom? Well, I, I actually did and I still do. Uh, because it gave the value and there's there's certain other things i can think of where it's just giving me so much value it's a no-brainer to pay but 
And a lot of developers, they just want to tinker. They want to learn. And so Sandro here is talking about um, Cloud Run. Cloud Run is a managed service from Google that we can just run a single container through. Also seeing um, Oracle Cloud. I know you've, you've kind of done a little bit of work with Oracle Cloud. And then AWS Freetier. And again, there are people here with your perspective. So hosting costs become irrelevant if you're getting money back from it. But if it's just for kind of kicking about, it can really be as cheap as $10, $15 a month to run all of the above. And then you you take some kind of uh, you take some kind of hit with it if things go wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's the mean time to recovery rather than the HA redundancy of a Google that actually makes sense. Now, one thing that I thought might help us is to kind of frame this and talk about, well, this little diagram I drew. I don't know if you ever get this where you, you're thinking of stuff, you're in bed trying to get to sleep and you just get these ideas coming in your head about, about the week. And this, this came up in my head and I was like, how can we talk about this? Well, our background, me working at ADP, you working in the enterprise was about it's all self-hosted. There was no cloud. We didn't run anything on the cloud at all. It was all our own data centers. It was actually all bare metal. And the thing that we ran there was a process, it was internet. Uh, it was IIS, which is the Microsoft product to run .NET code as web servers. And then at some point, some of those workloads went on to Hyper-V or ESXi from VMware. And they ran in a virtual machine. And then rather than shipping DLLs and binaries and what have you, we started shipping virtual machines. And then when I started to learn about Docker, I got so in love with the idea that what I shipped to production would work in production that I, I, I actually became an influencer for them. And I was writing one or two blog posts a week, um, going to conferences, talking about the technology, kind of how we met there with OpenFAS. And there you're shipping a, a container which is similar to a virtual machine in concept. It's a, a root file system. But then the operating system, let's say the kernel, is common amongst those containers. Some of the problems that we've had with, with Docker are like, how do you then take that to the enterprise and scale it? How do you get HA abilities? How do you recover from failures? How do you monitor these things? And Google's Kubernetes project is where that came in. And Whilst this can all still be running on premises or on servers you own, you can now take the container, put it into a pod, have a declarative instruction of how the system is to run that for you. So with Docker, if something crashed, you could set it to restart always for a certain amount of times. That's a really clever hack, actually. But if the node that's running on dies, you're in trouble. If you've got three nodes in your Kubernetes cluster and the node that thing is running on dies, it will eventually just get rescheduled on one of the other nodes and you'll you'll be back. You may have a bit of downtime, you'll be back to where you were. You can then fix that by running that workload on three different machines at once and load balancing it. And, and so really, when you look at this diagram, what we're seeing is a complexity curve almost on one side and benefits on the other. And we're abstracting and going more and more abstract until we get to FAS, where what we're shipping is the the maybe the JavaScript code that takes an input and produces an output, which may run in any one of these things. It might run in a container or a pod. Yeah, and this is a really interesting diagram because uh, I'm thinking through as you're walking through, you're talking about the 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 maturity of where the enterprise has gone in this enterprise approach, bare metal, you know, you just, you, you just think about it, you know, you just, you, you have an engine and you can build and do whatever you want. The problem is you can build and do whatever you want. And that theme kind of resonates throughout the entire stack of having the flexibility of doing whatever you want, but delivering it in a, in, in a less friction bound way. You know, if I wanted to, yeah. If I, as a de developer and enterprise, wanted to start a new project and we have all bare metal, provisioning a new bare metal server can take months. Moving to a hypervisor, obviously I can develop, I can uh, 
provision resources a lot quicker from a virtual machine perspective. But now as you think about the challenges of shipping, managing and shipping code, uh, you know, VMs, while much lighter than a uh, bare metal, bare metal yeah. it's, it's still relatively heavy. I have a BIOS with every deployment uh, in a virtual machine, which a very heavy file. Then moving to containers, you know, that that is, again, a, a, a revolution in the way we think about shipping, packaging and shipping code. But then running into the problem that I lose all of the core capabilities of a hypervisor which simplified my operations. Uh, so, you know, we go back to kind of, okay, how do we manage containers X scale and give these similar features that we had in bare metal and hypervisors, Kubernetes solves a lot of that. But then I think the ultimate goal, which I think developers, I think this resonates with developers most. I don't think developers necessarily care about Kubernetes, containers, hypervisors, bare metal, what have you. They just want to write, write code and then rely on those underlying services to uh, to deliver the infrastructure. But we get into, I think, one of the nuances of the conversation we're having today, which is if I'm running a side project, do I want to consume these higher level services when I can just simply deploy uh, 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 OpenFAS or one of the other uh, functions as a service applications on a Kubernetes pod and mm -hmm. nothing, almost nothing at the Amazon free tier layer. Yeah, and so we should definitely get onto the the, the 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 cloud managed side of that. But when you think about it at, at the self managed side, I think this is almost like um, a a tree of of where you can go. And so if you find that um, we we have a couple of people that have answered here, what are you using at work? What, David using Kubernetes. Amit was using VMware, and he's now looking to move to more of a DevOps-based system, and uh, and he means Kubernetes by that. And then we have Ian with Lambda. When you think about this progression, these are all things that you still have to manage. You still have to harden them. I remember you just talked earlier, you don't want to open your data center because it could be like a honeypot. You may have a issue in the bias of one of your virtual machines that's unpatched that makes you vulnerable. Um, I remember there was a container escape vulnerability with um, pretty sure it was a Docker. And uh, there was a company in Peterborough that I know that does insurance quotes and mortgage brokering. And they had to patch all these VMs that they'd deployed to Amazon's EC2 service through their own paths but every one of them had to be individually either completely recreated through pipeline or they had to go into each one and patch them manually because of an issue. And this is one of the things that when you start to use a managed service, it's very likely that the service provider is going to be spending the hours doing that kind of thing for you uh, and, and basically keeping the house in order. And so these things, these concepts do map quite well onto hosted services you can still buy bare metal. And I can think of uh, a company like Equinix Metal. Most of their customers, as I understand it, are, are telcos. And they may just be running normal processes on the bare metal, or they may be running a hypervisor. And then obviously, as you know, once you have a hypervisor, you can then go back to the beginning and you can start from here and virtual machine down. Um, but there's certain reasons why this makes sense. The, the basically having complete control over the machine, being able to do nested virtualization, having high performance networking available to you, um, not having to worry about multi-tenancy, real dedicated resources. Going down the chart a bit further, and if you imagine you're an organization on a, on a journey of transformation, you're asking, is Kubernetes right for us? The first thing you might want to ask is, is cloud right for us? And is it that we're using bare metal monoliths and we can just move those bare mo metal monoliths to servers that somebody else is going to maintain and keep up time, rack and stack, be able to add new ones in for us? Yeah, if you think about where I would like to go with my data center, this hosted model, there's a hybrid between this hosted model and the self-hosted model. There's a point where 
you know, we talk about undifferentiated work. When I need to upgrade the version of vSAN, which is the storage platform for VMware vSphere, I have to dedicate technical resources. Me, Keith Townsend, has to write a check to a uh, consultant to come in and upgrade vSAN. Why am I writing a check for something so mundane? Uh, that's something that I would gladly if i have to write a check i want to write a check for uh someone coming to deploy kubernetes for the first time helping me learn or develop something that i have not been able to do in my data in the past so this hosted or api driven model for consuming data center there's a kind of hybrid when you look at hyper converged systems dell's vx rail and nutanix's uh uh, systems or even VMware Cloud on AWS are of this model where that underlying hypervisor infrastructure, while I may consume it as I have traditionally in my enterprise, it's not hidden away from me, but the care maintenance of it is hidden away. So again, when we're talking to this audience about when we're self-hosting projects or looking at site projects, where is the value in the stack as I'm consuming the stack. If I want to consume VMs, at what level do I want to consume VMs? Do I want control of the hypervisor or do yeah. I just want to have a virtual machine API, which is where we're at now? Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the things I think is most powerful about something like Amazon EC2 or DigitalOcean's droplets is that from code, I can I can request run isolated runtime environments deploy something there, get a public IP address, start orchestrating it, have it come online just for a few jobs, and then go away um, if needs be. And I can add and remove that programmatically. And I'm not the one doing capacity planning. In fact, uh, I never really got into the weeds with that. But certainly, if you are running your own data centers, it's me. Apple talked about this at KubeCon last year. They have specific teams that are always doing capacity planning for their data centers. They've been hiring Kubernetes experts like they're going out of fashion in order to have the skills and team to build up this stuff that you can get from Amazon for free just by paying them 200 bucks a month for EKS, right, per cluster. Yep, unless you're just, uh, unless you have Apple sized problems, there is no capacity management other than budget management in public cloud. That's one of the one of the advantages. Saying that though, um, I have seen Equinix Metal run out of certain types of machine in certain regions. I've seen Sevo uh, Cloud VPS provider running out of capacity in different regions as well. And so this does, does still exist. I mean, cloud is just other people's computers. And if, unless they're on top of that, or unless they have a strategy, it, it can actually pass that problem on to you as well. Um, think about EC2, if you're trying to use spot instances to reduce your bills, you may find that in the East region one, there aren't any more left for what you want. And so you may have to go out to a completely different region or availability zone. And so sometimes a problem does come back to you, but in comparison to managing everything yourself uh, and having to send a consultant out, I mean, yeah, this is a completely different ball game. Yeah, at the onset of uh, the pandemic last year and the rush to move stuff to the public cloud, uh, Azure famously ran out of capacity. So this this it definitely happens. So if you're thinking about from a application DR perspective and something regionally happens, everyone is now depending on public cloud providers for their DR. And if something happens within the region, cloud providers. I've seen uh, certain EC2 instances not available in uh, Amazon, mainly in uh, Virginia East. That, that happens actually quite frequently, uh, that there's a spike and you just can't get the instance you want. Yeah. I, I mean, um, whenever Slack goes down, it tends to really impact a lot of companies. And some of the time when you look into the status page, it's Amazon S3 is down in one of the regions they use. And so, yeah, it, it does sort of lock us in. And with what I tried to do with open FAS and open source software is give people the ability to host their own things and maybe augment it. So it's partially public cloud, partially private, and there's some or, or maybe private services that are hosted on public cloud. 
Now, when I put this blog post together, which is kind of where this talk came from, the the idea was that maybe part of the hype curve was drawing drawing people to think that they needed to host their side projects, or even very small technical products on Kubernetes. I'm guilty of this myself. Uh, and I, I guess as a CNCF ambassador, it, it makes it more likely that I'm going to want to use Kubernetes. But it doesn't come without its own costs. Um, this is the hype curve from Gartner, and they talk about these technology expectations that get pumped up because there's a new innovation. They get to a real high peak, and eventually it's like a balloon. It goes pop. Uh, people then get really disillusioned with it, and eventually if it survives that, that technology might become stable and boring and, and people could be productive with it. And so I do wonder if to some extent, and maybe some of the people on, on the, the session can, can say whether they've felt this, there's a feeling like if you're not using Kubernetes, you're just not doing it right. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that I was just on the phone with some, uh, with, uh, with SRE from Starlink, which is the global uh, ISP satellite base that's owned by SpaceX. And they were talking about their journey to Kubernetes. And I asked them, you know, how did they come to the decision to use Kubernetes? Because he said it, uh, the SRE said it in a really interesting way. He was like, we're using Kubernetes today. And I asked them, how did they walk through the process of using Kubernetes? And they, you know, they actually went through kind of system requirements and, and all the way from like what it takes to produce a satellite, launch a satellite and the integrated processes around the applications associated with running the ISP. And they settled on Kubernetes today because it fulfilled the needs. But if Kubernetes didn't exist, they would have used a different architecture etc so one of the things that he says they struggle with and people struggle with fully is when i read hacker news there's always a time where i'm like man i need to get some kubernetes in my data center and it solves not a single problem that i have in my data center but from a geek's perspective i want to get kubernetes in my data center so how do you battle that is a good question i mean if if we were in charge of a team, if it's a C2 advisor, you've been brought in and, and you brought me in as well as a CNCF ambassador, we went in together and the client said, uh, you know, what should we be deploying or not? I think it could be common that it comes from the top down and the management is saying their seat is like, we need to be using Kubernetes. We've got to win. You know, we're not getting the adoption. And then it may be that um, that isn't the case. They're going, what should we be using? And they're saying, our team is crying out for Kubernetes. They say, we have to be using EKS. You know, I'm losing staff every week. And um, and that's where I really liked this, this Dilbert cartoon, which was um, which was the opposite, it was the top down. And if you're, if you're not careful, like if you have the top down and bottom up pressure together uh, and you're in the middle management, you're just trying to do your job, you might end up getting squished. Uh, and he said, look, I need to know why moving our app to the cloud didn't automatically solve all our problems. Um, and obviously the, the IT worker saying, well, you wouldn't let me re-architect the app to be cloud native, just put it in containers. Well, that was actually Docker's strategy for a while. I remember when Docker and VMware were tossling, maybe 2015, 16, um, they were like, let's lift and shift, let's just log into your VM. We're going to scan the file system. We'll create a, we'll create a container image, and we'll, it will just be fine. Yeah, I remember. I remember that at uh, even in 2017, there it was a uh, uh, the application modernization process was exactly that to take the monolithic application binaries, put it into a container, and then just run that as a container. And then you know you had these weird problems with in production that you know the the configuration files for a monolithic application are uh, directly part of the file system and they're uh they're stateful so you know when you lose statefulness you have to troubleshoot where are these configuration files and we're not even talking about databases we're just talking about just straight the app the app itself is stateful in the way that it's configured and maintaining yeah. that state so just random problems like that 
And then uh, just the final part of that, you can't solve a problem by just saying techie things and, and the answer is Kubernetes. Yeah. And I think there's probably a, a hidden question mark on that. And the point I was trying to make here is that, you know, it may be that management has heard about this cool new tech and they, they're they trying to push it. It might even be pushing open fans or, or serverless, or it might be that the developers are. Um, if the developers are pushing it, I think uh, it might have a bit more weight than if it's coming from the top down. Maybe they've been on a, set, a really long sales call with NetApp or goodness knows who else, and they've, they've come back all inspired. But we kind of, I don't want people to think that we're being negative about Kubernetes. Certainly, um, I don't think that it's necessarily the destination for every user. Mm -hmm. But I mean, look at me, I'm spending a huge amount of my time building an open source framework that only works on Kubernetes until recently with FASD, it only worked on Kubernetes. So I must believe it's got something to it. And so, our users must as well. And one of the things that really fascinated me, you, you, you've seen me progress, in my opinion, of Kubernetes over the period of time that you've known me. And when I saw uh, OpenFAS, one of my first experiences was, you know what, if I have to endure Kubernetes to get OpenFAS, great. I'll endure Kubernetes to get OpenFAS because Kubernetes wasn't the thing that I wanted. OpenFAS was the thing that I thought added value. And I love that you've kind of come full circle. We're kind of passing ships a little bit that you're uh, that now OpenFAS is available via FASD. And even someone like me, I could take FASD, deploy it on, on a VM and have functions and not the overhead of Kubernetes. Not that the overhead of Kubernetes is bad. I just don't need it for this particular the stuff that I do. Yeah. And, you know, that that is when I feel like Kubernetes might not be the right fit for companies. If the stuff that you're doing today is a side project and you want to use K3S on DigitalOcean or EC2, go ahead, just enjoy it. You know, if you feel like that's the challenge you want and that's what you want to learn, um, it might help. It probably will help you at work, especially if you work in DevOps. Um, if you want to build a Raspberry Pi cluster, you know, I do a lot of that. I love it. I've learned a lot. Um, it really helped me. But think about it when you're starting a project, because I guess this friend of mine, an old colleague from ADP, reached out and he said, look, we've got a SaaS product, 200,000 plus customers. It's a lot of customers. And you're just running it on one single VM um, with this Doku project as a PaaS. And you put your code into your GitHub repo. It triggers a build and you just get a new version of it. Um, and I was really pained because I couldn't just say to him, you should just use Kubernetes. And there was a problem it could help him with, which was that it wasn't HA. So if if the first VM died, there wasn't a second one to take over. Um, it couldn't scale with demand either, um, the way he had it. And so this thread, again, I'll, I'll drop this into the notes. It kind of started to look at it as, would his product scale, given that he was getting so many more customers, and how quickly could he recover from a loss of a node? Um, it was easy for him just to add ver vertical scaling. The vertical scaling is where you take one machine, you just make it bigger, more money, more resources, more RAM. Um, and that kind of fixed his problem at the time. But only it was like a ticking time bomb. It was going to come up again. And so um, and my gut reaction would be kind of Kubernetes, because I know it would just work for him. but. This is what he told me. He says, I don't know Kubernetes. I don't know DevOps. Can you tell me what cloud native means? Hmm. I'm a developer, and everyone I've hired is a developer. And I've only got the money to buy more developers to create more features to get our next funding round. We can't afford DevOps. Yeah, so this is one of those things that, again, and I love technology as much as the uh, next person. I was so tempted to go out and buy Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way. I actually may have bought it and just never read it because I love the technology. Like if you the I did a deep dive into the CSI driver the other day and I'm thinking, man, this is an amazing abstraction. I can literally back in my uh, 
persistent volumes with any storage technology that has a CSI drive. And I can interchange that in between providers. So when you, as a data center manager, when I'm thinking about moving, if I want to move the EMC to NetApp, all I have to do is re-implement the drive, move the data, re-implement the driver, and then it's invisible to the Kubernetes uh, cluster and pods above the CSI driver. I'm like, that's wonderful. However, my applications are not built that way. My applications don't use the CSI driver. My applications doesn't use persistent values. They're not designed that way. So while it would be cool to implement, uh, it's not solving a problem that I have. People yeah. have that problem and Kubernetes solves that problem. And I think this is where the situation your friend was in. Kubernetes solves a very unique Broad, set of problem. And, and, but for him, not so much. It wasn't worth the overhead of moving and learning Kubernetes. And actually, you know, I started to think this was a technology problem and it was about solving that problem. And the more I reflected on this and the more people sent in messages, I think that the problem was that he wasn't prepared to invest in operations. And as a developer, I can understand why. Mm -hmm. And so that was a kind of long shot of this. But back to the problem, um, no failover, no scaling, no monitoring, no way to measure latency. And he told me that he was running into timeouts. Um, has to be easy to understand, high, high, easy to onboard, we'll need a Git-based pipeline. So then, if you were going to move the Kubernetes, not only would he need to create a Docker file for every service that he had, you have to learn very complex YAML files that need tuning. You have to have health checks, readiness checks. They need uh, a lot of nesting in the YAML to get perfect. Um, you then need ingress, service, deployment, um, autoscalers. For pods and nodes, you need Helm charts for those resources a Docker registry somewhere to host that stuff. You need an ingress controller. You need cert manager to get TLS records to accept traffic encrypted. You need to add Prometheus to gather the instrumentation that you're yet to add to your app. You need Grafana to draw a dashboard to visualize it, a tool to do the CI, maybe GitHub Actions, but then something like Flux to get those new versions of your app and apply them in the cluster. And actually, all he wanted to do is make sure if the first VM went down, the customers wouldn't leave. Right. Um, now, I, I guess it didn't come to me, obviously, but somebody said, why doesn't he just run another VM and a, a DigitalOcean load balancer? Yeah. And, and I think that's what he went and did. And so all of those things I just listed off for one whole minute he didn't have to learn any of that. Not today. He may need to further down the line, or it may be that Amazon Lambda could have offloaded some of that work that he had, and he can augment it. It may be that um, he could use a managed product like Cloud Run that can run a container for us. But, you know, there was a simple way of getting him past that bump in the road. And so I think sometimes we go back to that, that curve, hype curve, and think, you know, why? I'll be asking the question, is Kubernetes right for us? Do we have a problem with our infrastructure? Is there a problem that it can solve? Are there capabilities like CSI or encrypted network drivers or multi-node because we, we've got to the limit of running containers on one host that we need to get to and that is going to benefit our product and the business? Yeah, I can easily see, especially, you know, but, uh, one of the things that I love about one of, one of the CNC the CNCF projects I love uh, is Ethio and Service Mesh. I am a huge fan of Service Mesh and the ability to authenticate applications or services between each other. This is a problem that has existed in the enterprise forever. And it's one of those things as you look at individual projects. And again, this is one of the things I like about uh, cloud native approach versus uh, the OpenStack approach of, uh, of a few years ago, you know, before I had to buy off this whole thing that was OpenStack. Now, if I want Container D, I can get Container D. If I want Istio, I can just do Istio. If I want the individual components, yes, they work best with Kubernetes, but I can, I can take these 
individual components and create something like a fast deed and get what I need. And then when I need to layer the more complex components of Kubernetes on top of it, Kubernetes e ecosystem on top of it, it's there and available to me. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned service mesh again there. That's that's one of the ones that comes up really frequently uh, when I'm talking to prospects when they're dropping by the OpenVAS community. So, well, you want a service mesh and you want to know whether it's Linkerd or Istio. Why do you want a service mesh? <laughs> and quite often the answer is something like, well, uh, we want to encrypt the traffic between our services. Have you heard of WeaveNet? It is a Kubernetes network driver that encrypts traffic between nodes. And it's super easy to install. It doesn't bring a big performance penalty and you get your result. Nobody wants the service mesh. And so it is tricky. Um, I think it's one of the things that can offer a lot of value in some circumstances. What I think is more interesting is that identity piece taking the authentication out of a myriad of services we have and just saying, right, what we're going to do is define a policy that this function can only talk to that one, can only talk to our mini OS3 self-hosted. Then that, I really think we start to get into some of the benefits. Um, the Linkerd team are very vocal about this as well, and they'll tell you not to adopt Linkerd if you want tracing, because that's not what service meshes are about. You can add tracing to your apps without it. Um, it doesn't even do tracing for you. It just gives you an idea of where the traffic has been. And actually, you have to fully adopt it in your infrastructure to know that the database call took this long and what have you. Yeah, it's one of those things, and it's really difficult. And I, I don't know if it's the nature of the CNCF and projects. You, you'd have more insight into this than I do. But I look at the when I look at the CNCF kind of eye chart that's you know that big, uh one of the problems you have is that you're overwhelmed by choice and options so it's very difficult to piece together the thing that you know i know that uh uh that linkerd with with tracing i know that that's a feature of linkerd istio with traffic and encryption i know that that's a feature but adopting this heavy project in my problems are simple Maybe you know I can use the full full advantages of a service mesh. I'm not aware of them always, uh, and my initial journey was to find some way to simply encrypt uh, two endpoints, which you know uh, I didn't even know about Weave. But you know, discovery of just learning what projects do what and what's the right size project for my application is really, really tough. Because in, in the big sense, you know, um, the, you know, in the big sense, there's an umbrella when a, in an enterprise, we hear that all of this is Kubernetes, where in, the, in reality, literally all we may need is a VM running a subset of these services and that fulfills the, the requirement. I mean, it, it's just the hotness, isn't it? Uh, and I think we, we've got to go back to the hype curve. Ask yourself the question, why? And think about if there's a, a, an alternative. I just want to find, um, you, you know, you've heard of um, Darren Shepard. Yeah. And you know what he's he's famous for, other than speaking his mind. I know he's famous for speaking his mind. Ever, ever than that, he's also famous for writing a Kubernetes distribution called K3S. Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, we've got so many responses on here. Things, there he is. Um, this is what he said. He spent the last three years building K3S and even before that building Rancher, which is another mm -hmm. Kubernetes orchestrator. Um, classic developer and very cheap. If it's a side project, as cheap as I can on a VPS, $15 a month, dumbest technology as possible, as long as I can back it up and redeploy. So I think if a creator and curator of one of the most popular Kubernetes distributions wouldn't necessarily even use it himself, we've got to ask ourselves the question, when is it actually right? And so, you know, there's a number of ways you can do that. I want to find, um, this other sort of related post. 
And just quickly, as we sum up the top of the hour, if you move to the cloud from using on-premises, um, the cost of 10 EC2 instances, the CapEx, as we call it, is completely different to buying two Dell Power Edge servers. Like you must have done and racked up in your server room and called consultants to come out and build the infrastructure. Um, if we need capacity, it's there for us pretty much all the time, unless you're in East Virginia, apparently, mm -hmm. you may struggle. Um, they always tend to come with visibility built in dashboards, compliance, audit trails, SSO features, things that a company like yours is probably going to need. On the cons, the spend can be unpredictable, particularly like I am scared of this because I've seen the blog posts on Lambda where a function called itself recursively and a guy woke up to a six-figure bill or five-figure bill. Then they, they call Corey Quinn to plead for him and make a lot of noise and try and get a refund from AWS, but they don't automatically go, yeah, we get it, this happens. You have that bill to clear and it could, you could lose your house. I mean, it, it's a very real risk. Um, and one thing that that is easy to do is you can click buttons, right? Your traditional uh, um, infrastructure guy can come along and click buttons. But if you want to do it properly, it's infrastructure as code and that requires Terraform, it requires Ansible, Puppet, Chef, an entire new world of tooling that is actually a pretty high learning curve. Yes, it is. Now, that's just EC2. Moving up to containers, um, one of the things that you can do here is, is kind of go back to the original motto, build, ship, run. I can build the code, I can ship it to a destination and run it there, and it'll be the same as what I've got here. And I can do it efficiently because I only have to ship the bits that haven't changed since I shipped it last time. It's developer friendly. I mean, um, containers seem to be of very little interest until Docker built a nice CLI around it. ThoughtWorks actually recommend containers. I think this is still their active recommendation. It was in 2018 as a way to avoid vendor lock-in. So I talk to prospects and they're saying, well, look, um, we could use OpenFAS or we could write an abstraction that deploys to Lambda, Google Cloud Functions and Azure Functions. And actually what ThoughtWorks are saying is don't write those abstractions anymore. Multi-cloud is a waste of money. Understand what it's gonna take you to migrate from Oracle to Azure and use containers because most of your application is gonna be built and packaged in them. On the con side, um, one fifth of images on the Docker Hub have vulnerabilities. Now, I can't imagine in your background that being particularly acceptable as a risk. No, that that is not a acceptable risk. I, I think most environments that I've been in that uh, you're not going to Docker Hub to pull images, not in production, no. In which case you now have to, for every base image and language and package you wanna use, Go back to the beginning, deconstruct and reverse engineer the Docker file, rebuild it on your own infrastructure, cache all of the layers, run a scanning tool like Trivi from Aquasec against it or one of the other products like SNCC. Keep those up to date. And now you've become the maintainer of that Docker image. Which is going back to some of the problems we had with VMs and maintaining VM gold images and et cetera. It is- It's a golden image, yeah. It's a heavy lift. And it's, it's more complex because you have more doc, you have way more Docker images than you have VM images. Yeah. And then, um, you know, when you're building locally, if you don't get it optimized, it can be really slow. Um, and elastic scaling just doesn't work out the box with Docker. You've got to get other technology. And that's generally where people come down this, this sort of tree is like, okay, done all of that. Now I'm here. Um, we've adopted Kubernetes. We're adopting containers. We can go between clouds, like ThoughtWorks said. How do we actually get to the next level? Um, on the pros, there is actually over 100 independent service vendors that are certified to give you paid support on Kubernetes. Rancher, again, being one of them, VMware being another, um, of all sorts of sizes to fit all sorts of budgets. 
So then when it comes to running this, you, you can potentially get a, a managed service where they run it all for you, or you can pay a vendor to come in and also do like the SRE work for you. I think of SciHub um, from Jacopo. He's been building a business around this. I think of Vision. They provide managed, self-hosted, OpenShift and Rancher. We talked a bit about this, didn't we? So if you were to lose a node, one of your workloads might be balanced across those machines and you may not get any downtime from it. That is difficult to do otherwise. Um, you have something like that in, in, in VMware, don't you, where you can move workloads when they... So the, there's a uh, couple of different features in VMware. One, I can vertically scale a, a VM dynamically. So if, you know, if, if I need... 24 gig of RAM instead of 16 gig of RAM or 32 processors. I can easily make that change without a reboot. Then there's, I can move the VM from, if there are noisy neighbors, I can VMware will automatically move the VM to a machine that's, that is, doesn't have noisy neighbors. And then there's a, a, a HA where if, uh, if a VM physically fails or the, OS physically fails, then it'll relaunch that VM on another host, et cetera. So you have uh, built-in infrastructure features to uh, deal with capacity problems and availability problems. And then the storage, it effectively, the storage is running off a network. So right. it's not like you have to save the storage off that physical node and bring it across. No, it's, it's, the storage is shared and protected anyway. So you're mainly just protecting the compute. Yeah. So, you know, some of the things we're talking about with Kubernetes as pros, you can find in the traditional products if you want to, if you want to use them. Um, and or maybe you're already using them. Now, there are dozens of paid products in the ecosystem. And when you look at the CNCF landscape, there's hundreds. But what I mean is there's dozens for each category. There's like two dozen storage products, three dozen networking drivers security things, governance products, and more. Um, there was at one point 60 different serverless projects on the serverless CNCF landscape. Your choice is really broad. And when you come to Kubernetes, you can start using these things where you can't use them on a VMware, uh, ESXi, traditional hypervisor, or you can't use them on EC2. You can't install Istio to EC2 and just have it on one VM. There's products that are purpose designed, like OpenFAS, only for Kubernetes. And so that's definitely a big pro here as well. Um, and again, like there's a lot of different, every self-respecting um, cloud vendor has their own managed Kubernetes. It doesn't have to be that point where you have to be the one on the line doing upgrades of nodes and being on call you can basically pay for an SLA and have the cloud vendor do it for you. Um, and then going back to Darren, you can run K3S on a Raspberry Pi. So it, it is pretty heavyweight. It can be difficult to understand, but actually, um, you know, you can run it on very low commodity hardware. You can customize it. We've talked about CSI. We've talked about CNI. We've talked about service mesh, serverless security, image scanning, that, you know, the end, the list is endless. And just to kind of wrap up quickly, uh, on the cons, there are people that are scared of Kubernetes um, that haven't tried it yet or yeah. haven't given it a fair try. And I don't know how this has been with you. I know we've both sort of been learning how to run an independent business. There's some stuff that's just hard in life and you, the way we learn is by experiencing confusion because that's when these new neuro connections are being made in our brain and out the other side of it, we gain knowledge, we gain experience. And I think sometimes we, in our microwave generation, we just expect an instant results. And, and sometimes you've got to go through a bit of learning to get to, to true value. Yeah, you're not going to break these uh, patterns that have created the problems until you learn new patterns. So and that's hard, especially for some of us that's been in the industry for 10, 15, 20 years. And we've developed these patterns and, it's, and Kubernetes uh, in general challenges uh, the patterns, microservices, uh, the just concept that containers don't have 
independent bioses. Those things challenge the way that we've just approached managing infrastructure. Now, we don't quite have time to go into this, but maintaining sort of five Kubernetes controllers as I do um, with the community's help, it is not easy. The API breaks almost every point release. Um, there's this whole scheme of alpha, beta, GA, and when something moves between them, quite often they'll have breaking changes. Um, Ingress is an example of that. The CLI, uh, the way you run, contain run containers on Kubernetes, and I wrote a blog post about this. You know, what broke in Kubernetes 118 and how to fix it. And it is something that you hear. Companies are like, we we are we're getting to Kubernetes, and also we want to write our own controller. Yay, we're cool now. We'll put it on Hacker News. But think twice because you're going to have to maintain that every time the API breaks, and you're going to have to think which version it's compatible back to and forward to at the same time. And it may get particularly complicated as if you've used a framework to build that controller that might get deprecated. They might put breaking changes in that itself and you're having to rewrite this code for no benefit. And I found myself in that position so many times over the last 24 months where I've spent a week migrating five operators and I've got no benefit from it other than they still work. Mm. So if you're waiting to try Kubernetes and you haven't yet, this might be a little bit older now, but this was the trail map. Um, put together by the CNCF. And it just like we've been talking about today, we're trying to find a way. Start with containers and cloud. Move to CI, CD. Think about whether you want to have orchestration and a way to define your application, maybe using Helm. And you'll notice as you go through this, some of the things towards the bottom, messaging, uh, networking, policy, service mesh, are way down your journey. And it could be that you just want to start today, build experience, see what works, um, and find out if it is a good fit for you. Because it's easy to start, but if you've put in two front feet, it could be quite hard to sort of go back. Great insight, great conversation, Alex. So look, Keith, um, as we kind of wrap up this talk, I've really enjoyed sort of getting your perspective on this. What do you think is next for uh, for Kubernetes and and what's next for you as well? So people can kind of get an idea of what you're doing. So uh, Kubernetes needs, I don't know if I, I think I need to revise my statement. Kubernetes doesn't need to become any simpler. I think Kubernetes is what it is. Um, uh, it solves very complicated problems, and we always want to make simple. Uh, we always want uh, complex, simple solutions to complex problems, and that's just not being realistic. So I've been guilty of saying I, Kubernetes needs to be easier. Yes, it does need to mature, but it is what it is from a architecture perspective. We are actually publishing probably within the next week or two a guide to enterprises as they think through Kubernetes, some of the high level decision points that will be posted to the website, webcptadvisor.com. It's probably the most exciting thing we have going on that your audience may be interested in. Thanks. And um, your website is ctoadvisor.com? It is the ctoadvisor.com. Whoever owns ctoadvisor.com doesn't want to sell it because every time I put in uh, an inquiry, it's never answered. I've, 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 I've actually hired a broker to try and buy it and they just no answers they they don't want to sell it there's there's a domain that i would really like as well i think um it's either inlets.com or something like that and yeah sometimes you have luck sometimes yeah sometimes you don't but keep on at it hopefully you'll get it eventually um follow keith he has a podcast uh you'll probably hear me and him talking on it at some point in the future we've done a session on inlets recently um, there's Keith's hot take on open fares from 2017 in his hotel room after trying open whisk. He went and moved on. Um, and like I say, if Kubernetes is on your radar and you're not quite sure if it's going to fit for you, feel free to reach out to either of us. I'm sure we'd be happy to speak to you and see if there's a way we can help. So 
without further ado, I'd like to thank Keith for joining us today and for all the questions. See, we've had like quite a lot of people, quite a lot of discussion. You've got the show notes with the two Twitter threads we looked at. You've got the diagram I put together this morning, uh, the blog post. There's another video there. Just go check it out, see what gels with you. And likewise, uh, I'll hope to see you again Thursday, where I'll be joined with um, an ace, Ulrich, from Codefresh, and we're going to be exploring K3S with ketchup. Okay. Thank you, Keith. And we'll leave it there. All right, Alex. Thanks. Bye, everyone.